My name is Carrie Miller. Uh, this talk is titled Why We're Bad at Hiring and How to Fix It. It's um, um, clearly, uh, I'm going to tell you all about how, why manhole covers are round and how many golf balls fit into planes. Um, no, I'm actually not going to do that. Um, for me, um, I've interviewed a whole bunch of people, and I think that the way that we go about interviewing people is a little broken. And that's what I want to talk about. How are we hiring people? How are we, uh, what's the process that we're passing them through, and how can we improve it? Uh, for a little bit of context, um, I work for Living Social, um, who is in fact hiring. We do most of the awesome things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, my title there is Lead Software Developer. Uh, I work primarily with heavy metal, uh, doing uh, typecasting. You know, uh, we're bringing it back old school in 2015. I figured since we print coupons, basically, yeah. movable type. Uh, I'm based out of Seattle, which according to William Shatner um, is basically Waterworld. <laughs> Dry land is a myth. My boat. Um, and I've been really fortunate, though, to get out of that rain to come down to, to uh, Georgia here. And um, I discovered this wonderful thing at the grocery store. Um, that is the largest tea bag in the world, I think. Uh, and I don't know if anybody notices, but it's family size. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine the teacup that the family gathers around to share, <laughs> huddled in their, their little Georgia shack, away, afraid of the tornadoes. Um, yeah, so I work for Living Social. Um, I've been there about 10 months, and before that, um, I was a teacher at Ada Developers Academy, uh, which um, is a program in Seattle, based in Seattle um, that works with women who are transitioning into technology. Um, it's a seven-month uh, educational program in the classroom, followed by a five-month internship. Uh, they just started up their third cohort, um, and they're doing, doing really great. Um, this isn't a pose shot. This is a picture of uh, some students in our first cohort. Um, I think that they figured out JavaScript um, in that slide, and that's why I love it, because it's very inspirational to me, because that they can do it, and I can do it, too. Um, but uh, part of the, the way that we place them in the internships is that all of the sponsoring companies come in for this one day, uh, what we call like speed interview dating. Um, and I think it feels a little bit like this um, to the women. Um, this is actually how I feel whenever I'm uh, interviewing, uh, no matter what side of the table I'm on. You know, if I'm trying to get the job or if I'm trying to hire somebody, I, you know, I feel like a character out of this. And part of the problem is that uh, interviewing, just in general, is this extremely stressful process, right? Like, uh, we have to hire somebody, and oh, I'm taking time away from my, 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 uh, my day job to like, go talk to somebody who may not even know FizzBuzz. Um, if you're trying to get a job, like, you're trying to get a job, right? Like, that's kind of stressful. You've you got to get the monies. Um, and interviewing itself really gives us a lot of, uh, fails us. It gives us a lot of false negatives and false positives um, in the form of not hiring truly great people or hiring the wrong people or people that like, we just end up ultimately disappointed with. And in general, this whole thing just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth um, from both sides of that table. And a poor interview process suddenly poisons the environment. Um, because if we don't trust the, the, the interviewing process, then how much can we trust the people that we work with? How great are they really um, to start with? And we end up with um, the FNG problem. Um, are people familiar with the FNG idea? Yeah, it kind of comes out of the military. It's the, you know, the FN new guy. You know, you don't talk to that one because He's going to stand up on a landmine. You know, don't get to know him. You know, he's the one who's going to get you killed, so you stay away from him. And in software, we tend to do that a little bit. When that new person gets hired, we kind of stay away from them a little bit, and we kind of like we spend more time looking at their code because we don't really trust them. We don't trust that process that they got there. Because our process um, is leaving us high and dry. It's a cargo cult, right? We don't, very few of us actually actively study um, how do we hire people? What's that process like? Until you get to like the management level, and then you're you're looking at compliance, right? Like, oh, we can't ask if you know you're thinking about having children or how old are you. Um, we don't ask about those tactical questions that you should be asking to kind of get at the things or or what was that process? We just sort of say, hey, someone says, hey, Carrie, you're going to be interviewing today, and I say, oh, great, and I Google how do I interview, um, <laughs> and I end up with this, um, which is a load of malarkey. Um, but uh, Spolsky, uh, Joel Spolsky wrote a very influential uh, essay, um, Smart and Gets Things Done, and he turned it into a book and has done very well for himself, and he's hired smart people who get things done, and that's worked great for him and his company. But not every company wants to write the next Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow? Um, 
And really, smart and gets, these, gets things done, or it's, it's inverse that Steve Yeagy came up with, which is done and gets things smart. Um, both kind of miss the point. How many people here are awesome developers? Oh, there's a few hands up. How many people here are bad developers? <laughs> yep, uh, just based on the numbers here. Although I think, I think it's a little, little flatter, but generally like, right, like all of us fall in this bell curve, right? Like, but even the worst of us kind of, we, we, if we're working, we can do the job, right? And we talk about like that 10X programmer all the way over there on the right. Um, who don't exist, and similarly, the, the, the tail of this doesn't exist either. So most of us are falling in this middle, right? And most of the people you're gonna to talk to in that hiring process are mediocre, right? So like, how do you figure out like what kind of mediocre are they? Um, and it's not like we're dealing with like mega billions of dollars. Actually, is anybody like hiring for, for CEO roles because I am uh, available? Um, <laughs> I, I don't have, my demands aren't much. I, you know, small seven, seven digit, I'm sorry? Yes, talk to me afterwards. Um, damn, I said I love for living social, they might watch this. <laughs> we'll not talk later, sir. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, when, we do hi when, they, when we hire for those like extremely sensitive positions, like CEOs, um, billions of dollars on the line, how do you think that they, those folks do? Forbes did this research, uh, or excuse me, Business Week. Um, this is uh, stock price versus um, the CEO pay. There's absolutely no correlation between CEO pay and the return of the stock. I mean, there's a few outliers, but for the most part, like, you know, we're at this, this median point here. And this is when there's billion, millions and billions of dollars on the line, and it's all these people do besides play golf is interview each other. They should figure out how to do it, right? Like, what makes a good CEO? They should be figuring it out. That's their only job, their one job, to hire this guy, and they can't figure it out. So how can we do it for our new startup that's like Uber for My Little Ponies? Like, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it turns out that if you start Googling around, you're gonna find um, a lot of advice, a lot of it's bad. But the good advice boils down to really basically three points. Know what you're looking for, find the people who have it, and then improve your process. Excuse me. So what are you looking for? Well, that depends on you and where you work. I've been a manager of a number of teams, and the best metaphor that I've ever come up with or thinking about my team is a closed ecosystem, or really like a small mountain valley somewhere. And we have wolves, and we have rabbits, and there are insects, and worms, and trees, but it's a balanced ecosystem. And as soon as I hire somebody else, or somebody leaves, I'm removing something from that ecosystem. So something has to change. The, the famous story of Hawaii, uh, being overrun with rats that came off of the, the early European ships that came there. They were like, I, I know what we'll do. We'll release some snakes, and the snakes will eat all the rats, right? That's a great idea, because there's, no there's no snakes in, in Hawaii. It's an island. Well, now you've got snakes. And the snakes eat the birds, and that's kind of bad, too. So now you have to release mongoose, and you're kind of like this like, constant, like, um, this constant cycle of, of always chasing your tail with your, your ecosystem. So you have to kind of understand that each addition, each additional person has a certain percentage weight that they're going to do. Um, someone was telling me that they, you know, they work for a company of 30 people. So hiring any one person, that person is now one, uh, one three percent. <laughs> they're now three percent of the company, right? So that chain, that's going to have a really noticeable impact. If you're on a team, maybe you're in a big company though, and you think, oh, well, any one person is going to change it. But if you've got eight people on your team, you hire one more. That person is now one-ninth of your culture. That's going to be a huge change. If you lose a person, you've lost an eighth of your culture. Well, you can get around that by hiring people exactly like you. Right? Treat, treat us all as the same and sort of like plug us in as uh, spare parts. But that just clones ourselves into a monoculture. And the problem with monocultures is diseases come along and they die. Do you all know about the monoculture in bananas? No. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you about bananas. What can I talk about, you know, ecosystems and ecology? Um, bananas are a monoculture. They are all genetic clones of each other. And 
The interesting thing about bananas is um, you may be familiar with the idea that bananas are slippery. Bananas aren't actually all that slippery. If you actually like, get a banana peel and step on it, it doesn't really slide. So why did that joke come around? Well, it's because it's a monoculture. The bananas we eat today are not the bananas that our parents ate. And those bananas that our parents ate were not the bananas that their parents ate. Because what happened is, every 20 or 30 years, a massive blight comes around, destroys the entire banana crop. Entire countries have been devastated in Central America. Their entire economy is wiped out because all of a sudden, in a matter of like five years, all the banana fields die. Similarly, on teams, if we're all alike, if we're all a monoculture, memes come all around. These ideas that we have about the, the right way to do software development, the right tools to use, if we're not bringing in fresh ideas, fresh diversity of thought, we can fall prey to those, uh, those idea diseases. So there's been a lot of talk the last couple of years, though, about diversifying, um, especially in terms of culture. But in order to understand um, what different is, you have to understand who you are to begin with. So you have to start to define your culture, which takes a lot of work, but it's really worth it. You have to start before you even, you even start hiring. You have to know what you're going to do. You can't just do this on like a Tuesday because you're going to have candidates in on Wednesday. It should be something, especially if you're a team lead, you should be working on constantly questioning and defining it. Now, a lot of people know that I went to a hippie school. Um, I have a professional hippie degree um, in being a hippie. Uh, that's why I don't have any shoes on right now, <laughs> among other reasons. Uh, but one of the things that we, we do there, um, we work in like small groups to study things rather than a classroom. It's um, group discussion, dynamics, working on group projects. Um, and we work on this idea of generating belief, therefore statements, that first day of class. And so we say something like, we believe in respect. Well, what does respect mean? Right? So we say, we believe in respect, therefore we will show up in time for all meetings. Because the idea is we want to say, we all have this vague idea. So let's say our idea is, let's be professional to each other. We're all, we're all professionals, and we treat each other with respect. Well, maybe you came out of a very rigorous academic environment where aggressive questioning of somebody else's um, output is, is the norm, right? And, and you think that's treating me with respect, to constantly question what I do and my decisions. I just think you're an asshole. Right? So, so what, are these, what are these abstract ideas that we have about who we are, that we're friendly, that we're open, that we're honest with each other? Generating therefore statements gives us um, actual tangible things that we can measure, things that we can look at and say, yes, this is what this vagueness looks like. And I know that this is some, some of you are thinking that it's kind of a waste of time. This idea that you know, we need to sit, sit around, and, like hold hands, and have a meeting, and talk about our feelings. Um, and it does take time and effort. But if you want to have an ecosystem of a team or a company that can really grow and thrive and treat individuals well, and be a place that people are happy to come to work, and are happy to recommend other people to, and are invested and enthusiastic about the product that you're building or the services you're providing, you have to create this kind of environment. Finding people who have it. Once you figure out actually who you want, not just the skills that you actually need, right? That list of like, well, must you know have you know five years of experience or an equivalent BA, or vice versa. Um, you know, have to have to know Java, C plus plus, must be DHH. Uh, oh, and they also have to like show up on time for meetings. You got to kind of find them. And I assume that this is, I, I, I think it's fair to assume this is a hiring process that most of you have gone through at some point in your career, even if you're just starting out, even if you're transferring in from another thing, you've kind of probably gone through this process. Anyone not ever gone through this, these, this typical process? Okay, one person, there's always one person, and it's always the same person. <laughs> hiring, this hiring process though is there for a reason, right? Uh, nobody ever invents anything or does something without a really good reason that is perfectly finely tuned for the environment they're in, right? Someone came up with this idea of here's, here's the hiring process because we don't have time to interview every single person who wants to come and work for us. We simply don't. So we need to filter down to just the most likely candidates. So you can think of each step of your hiring process as a filter and then consider 
what that filter allows in and what it rejects. So for example, if I insist that you have a GitHub profile and an actual like open source contributor status, well, now I'm rejecting everybody who doesn't have spare time or people who might have kids, who, you know, who just don't have time on the weekends and evenings to do open source. Or maybe they have a security clearance that th doesn't allow them to share any code whatsoever, even in obfuscated code samples. Um, maybe your recruiters and HR department are requiring people to submit things in Word. That's my favorite, right? Could you send me a doc of your, of your resume? Um, my trick with that, uh, personally, I just export my LinkedIn profile. So yeah, whatever. I don't actually have a resume. Um, phone screens are tricky. Like, what if, um, what if the person has a f um, what you might consider a funny accent, or it doesn't have English as a first language? So the phone screen is difficult, right? You've biased yourself against that. So understanding each of these steps, what they reject and what they allow through can help you make sure that you're getting the actual candidates that you want at the interview time. Because that's what it's all about. I heard one giggle. Come on, I gotta get more than that for this. <laughs> I love this photo. Um, I, I originally found this photo. I searched for like interview day uh, in Google Image Search, and for whatever reason, this came up. I'm like, what the? So I clicked through, and it was just an image, like on an imager page. And there's a link that said, click here for more information. I'm like, no. I want no context for this image ever. <laughs> um, interview day is, is really like the critical high touch point. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about most today, right? That actual like face-to-face -face interaction you're gonna have. Um, communicating the, the schedule to the, the person coming in is super important. I go to a lot of interviews or, um, or I have in my life where they say, yeah, 10 a.m. And they're like, I don't know, is it gonna be like two hours or eight hours or is it a three-day process? Communicating that process uh, up front and setting those expectations. Um, please bring a laptop, candidate, or don't bring a laptop. Um, we'll be going to lunch or not going to lunch. So that the candidate like, has some like, comfort that there's a structure and a plan here. Um, that kind of stuff is really professional and it sets a really nice tone. Um, it can be friendly, it doesn't have to be stayed you know, and like, kind of buttoned down, but just like, it shows confidence in your process, and that, tr that generates that uh, confidence in the part of the uh, person who's being interviewed, and they're more likely to like, be happier and more relaxed. Um, if you're, uh, you should always have uh, a diverse set of interviewers, um, not just um, visible uh, minorities, but also invisible minorities, if you can, um, and allow for breaks in your schedule for the day. Um, <laughs> Right around the fourth hour and the fifth cup of coffee, like I really want to run to the bathroom <laughs> and uh, make sure that you've got time in between for the candidate to do those sorts of things. Um, for the candidate to also say like, oh yeah, I've got to make a call. You know, so they can call and say, nope, sorry, I'm still sick, boss. Yeah, I can't come in today. Um, and part of this also is having uh, this game plan. Um, I like to split up the interview. Uh, so say we're hiring for a Rails developer, right? And that, that involves a little bit of front end, some JavaScript, some back end, a little database knowledge. I try to split that up and assign interviewers to specific areas of focus, right? They might be pairing for some, on something for an hour or two, but like, you know, hey, Mike, could you focus on how well the candidate knows SQL? Um, or hey, Joe, could you work on how well they know JavaScript? Um, that makes sure that you're getting really good coverage and you're getting good interactions without like someone asking the same three to five questions over and over and over again, because um, that's kind of ridiculous. And then just having like that, those breaks in between interviewers so that um, you can hand off the, the interview to the next person. There's nothing worse than like, okay, so you wrap up with that first person in the, the interview loop and they're like, okay, well, I'm gonna go get Joe and uh, he'll, be your next, he'll be your next interviewer. And then as a candidate, you sit there and it's a little uncomfortable. And you sit there for like 20 minutes and like, have they forgotten about me? What's going on? And it turns out like, oh no, Joe forgot and he went out to coffee. Or there's a fire, you know, and the server's melting down. There's always a fire every interview I go to, right? And they're like, oh man, I'm sorry, I'm so unorganized, you know? Um, but really like respect the interview process. Um, again, because it, it, it shows that confidence in that process and it, it kind of transmit out, not just to the candidate, but to other people in the company that like we have a good process, we believe in it. Um, it should be an enjoyable thing for everybody. 
And, and that, that handoff lets me go to the next person and say, oh, Joe, hey, listen, I know I was supposed to talk about data structures with, with Alice, but you know, I just I didn't get enough signal on that. I didn't get enough information about what we need. So could you ask this question? And every, every interviewer should have like a standard three to five questions that they're going to ask on, that to on the topic that you know, they've chosen or has been assigned to them. So you can compare apples to apples across candidates. You know, so you have like um, an un, a, a less biased uh, interaction to sort of look at. Um, usually, I'm the hire. I've always, almost always, been the, the hiring manager or someone running that process. Um, I really like to be like the first person to like just settle them in, have a casual conversation. Hey, how did you get here today? Do you have everything? Kind of shoot the breeze. Uh, I might double check if there's any red flags that came up between phone screen and getting the person in. So like, um, hey, we did it. <laughs> that university doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, you see, it says you have a, a, a computer science degree from Columbia, but we called them. Oh, oh, the country, Columbia. Okay. <laughs> hey. um, it also gives me a chance to learn how this person communicates. So maybe um, maybe English isn't their first their first uh, their first language. Um, and I might want to let that let people know, just like, hey, you know, be a little a little more uh, forgiving with uh, with those sorts of things. Or maybe they have um, a hearing or speech impediment, and I just want to I just want to pass that along, you know, like to somebody like maybe you can enunciate more, all those sorts of things to to the other interviewers, right? Um, and that just sort of like sets it up uh, everybody for make it a smooth process. This is usually the point where um, behavioral interviewing as well. Um, where we start asking like those hypothetical uh, gameable questions. For example, um, how would you handle conflict with a coworker? Oh, well, of course, you know, I went to HR and we, we sat down, we had some mediation and we, you know, we kind of worked it out. We learned, to, we learned some boundaries and like, yeah. that's what everybody says, right? Have you ever been in an interview and had the person say like, oh, well, this one guy, let me tell you. So then I super glued things together. You know, and I like spiked his chair, and I, then I punched him. It was a bad scene. That's why I'm looking for work. <laughs> um, that's what we call an HR red alert. Um, that has actually happened to me once. Like, yeah, some guy just came in and just told this horror story of like cold cocking his boss, and that's why he was looking for work. And I was like, well, maybe he deserved it. I don't know, right? Um, but by the same token, right, like the question I'm asking is one that everyone knows what the answer is. Um, when you're asked, well, how would you how would you handle a salesperson coming in asking for a feature at the last minute? It's a rush job. So, oh, well, the answer should be, well, I go to my boss and you know I, you know I work out the schedule and see how it's important. And yeah, you know, no one's ever going to say, oh, I tell them I'll do it and I don't do it, because <laughs> people want to get hired and they know what the game is. They know what the game is. And this this is just like puzzle questions in a way. Um, I don't like, I, I come from a theater background. Um, I did a, you see my degree is in, but I, I didn't actually get the degree, so I've got you know, degree work uh, in performance production. And I've, I've been on stage quite a bit. And I like to think of the interview process as an audition. So what I want to be doing is I want to be seeing how does this person actually perform? Not just what do they think, but how do they actually do the work? Um, so I usually start out uh, with one person doing a collaboration audition where instead of normal whiteboarding, let's just plan an app. Let's look at the high level. What are your considerations? Not do you know FizzBuzz or do you understand recursion, but do you understand how sockets work? Do you understand how HTTP communication cycles go? Do you understand what JSON is? Um, that sort of stuff comes out really highly when we start just like planning out a system and how, how would we start a new project? Pairing auditions. In the Ruby community, we do a lot of pairing auditions. Uh, as part of our interviewing process. Um, not everybody does, though, and not everybody pairs in their day-to-day, -day, so it's it can be really uncomfortable and weird for a candidate, so let them know up front if that's something you're going to be doing. And by all means, tell them to bring a laptop and let them use their laptop, because there's nothing worse than being forced to use somebody else's laptop with Vim on it when you're me and you don't know Vim or you only know how to quit. <laughs> I should get that tattooed, actually, somewhere. That'd be a great tattoo. Right, that's kind of stuff's bad. So if they're an Emacs user, like don't say shit about them. Like just let them use whatever. Right, it doesn't really matter. What you're looking for is, um, you can ask them about why they chose a particular tool, and maybe it's because they they don't know about them. 
you know, it's, it happens. Maybe they, they tried Vim, but they just don't like it because their favorite tool is, you know, built into BB Edit or whatever. So let them do it. If you're doing a, um, a code sample as part of the interview or like a little tiny code project, um, use that, like, like use that as the basis for your pairing. Like talk about refactoring that. Um, say, hey, like let's, we'll work on that. Um, give them feedback. See how they handle collaboration and feedback. Do they get, are they defensive? Are they not? Are they accepting? Can you bounce ideas off of them? Do those things fit in with what you and your company are looking for? Um, I also do presentation auditions. Um, I find that like communication skills are super, super important, even for like the shyest, most introverted among us. We have to communicate with people. Um, some of us do it verbally. Um, almost all of us do it constantly all day long in our writing. Code is communication, email as well. So I like to have candidates uh, actually teach me something. Um, Google used to do this in the early days, uh, but they would spring it on people. Sergey would say like, okay, I'm gonna leave the room in five minute, for five minutes, and then I'll come back and uh, teach me something I don't know. Um, that's a lot of pressure. We did this at Amazon as well. Um, it actually works really, really well, but I think it's a little bit of uh, kind of a, ha, ha surprise, you're on stage. Um, so I, I usually tell people ahead of time uh, when they come in that that's gonna be part of their process. I tell them basically, do a lightning talk. Right? Teach me something I don't know. It doesn't have to be technical. I've had people teach me how to build aquariums. Uh, one guy taught me how to paint his, ha his house, like specifically his house. He had photos of it and everything. Um, I, he might have been trying to recruit me for some weekend work. I don't know. Um, but basically, like, look about how can they, they communicate ideas to somebody who may not have the full context or background of knowledge. Do they use a lot of technical terms without checking with you? Um, are they, do they dive right in? Do they kind of like take uh, stock of, of where you are in relation to painting, for example. Um, how, do they, how do they do that? It doesn't have to be a lightning talk presentation. Um, it could also be like maybe like do a written blog post for us, you know, just like as, as a, write, a written sample. Uh, you can kind of negotiate this with the, uh, with the candidate themselves. Again, you're looking for communication and how well they're, they're doing that. Oh, and make sure you tell them like not to prepare ahead of time. Because you don't want someone spending like eight hours building like a five minute presentation that like no one's ever gonna see, right? So just like let them know like we don't expect a huge, you know, dog and pony show. Um, a note on the interviewing lunch, which is super popular. Um, I like food. I like food. Um, if you wanna buy me a free lunch, that, that would be wonderful. Um, but if you, if you do take the candidate to lunch, um, make sure again, tell them up front and make sure that you pay and tell them that you're gonna pay. Um, because there's nothing worse than get, then, um, maybe that person um, is really unemployed and doesn't have the funds to go to the fancy, you know, the fancy grass-fed organic burger shack. Maybe they can't go there. Um, so don't let a person's ability to pay for this, this fancy lunch get in the way. Most companies, I, I've, I've only once had a company expect me to pay for my own lunch at one of these things. That was, that was a little awkward. Um, Try not to overwhelm the candidate. I mean, a lot of times, like, we go out with, like, a group of four or five to the interview lunch. Uh, I one time went to an interview lunch uh, with nine people from the company. Um, I actually have a little bit of hearing loss, um, which is nice, because I can actually hear y'all, like, laugh a little bit. If you want to do it more, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, so I, I have a really hard time in like loud bars and parties, like especially here at the conference, you know, like I'll, you know, I come and say hi, but I, I have a really hard time with that. Um, the audio is, is off. Um, so at a long table, I can't talk to people more than like one or two seats away from me, simply because I can't hear them. I can't hear them clearly. I can just, mm, yeah, nice, like, hi. Yeah, that's about the most I can do. Um, so why did we go to lunch with nine people? You know, like I talked to like the two people around me and everyone else just talked about their job. You know, they didn't get a chance to meet me. They just got in on a free lunch. Um, so keep that like a small, intimate sort of thing and relax and casual. Uh, remember that the candidate is still being interviewed and they're aware of it. They're still on their like best, get, what my mom would call guest behavior. Um, they're gonna mind their P's and Q's. It's not as relaxed and culture fitty as we might think, but it is a little bit just a different venue for, uh, for communicating with them and seeing how they go. Um, avoid uh, bars, uh, avoid alcohol for this. Um, not everybody drinks, um, and if you don't want to communicate that you have to drink in order to be part of, to get this job, um, I think it's pretty horrible. Um, pick some place that's nice, but not too nice, you know, not too seedy, not too run down, but not you know, super fancy, um, 
And again, let the candidate know, because they might have rented like a nice tuxedo to come to the thing, and now you're asking them to eat soup. Like, that's, that's just dangerous. Anyway, this is a good time to like, talk about hobbies and passions and the things that you do that aren't work, but inform what you do. And remember through all of this that the person wants to get the job, and they're really nervous. And they're on stage, basically, in front of, in front of you, performing. And that is really, really hard. It is really, really hard. And you don't want to make fun of somebody. You know, somebody who's just bad at their job. Because maybe they're having, maybe they're having one bad day, or maybe your one interviewer is having a bad day. I mean, it takes a few like examples of this not being good to really like cement that like this is not the right candidate for us. Um, I can't help it. This is Raul Abanez, a professional baseball player, who uh, was once famously quoted in that he takes pride in his defense. Uh, he was rated uh, the worst defender in all of baseball. <laughs> and he played left field for the Mariners, which is a very defensive position. So just be aware that, like, you know, you can't... <laughs> you want to see more? Go back. I don't mind. This is my favorite. He just, like, runs on the wall. Like, oh, jeez. <laughs> um, anyway, the point here, though, is that... Um, we're not, we're not all bad, bad like Raul, right? Like, we might blow one piece of the interview. Um, for example, I always forget the difference between left outer and right inner joins. Which I guess they're probably the same thing. I don't, I don't know. Right? But if I biff that, like, should I get completely flushed out of the interview process because I got nervous, you know? Or maybe, you know, my, if I had a kid, maybe my kid is sick, and so I'm off on that interview day. So kind of take those things into account when you can. After the interview, your portion of the interview is over, you go back to your desk, don't go back to work. Write down your impressions of the candidate right then. Write down yes or no, I would hire this person or not hire them. But then, what would change your mind? So if you saw Raul Obanez totally biff that play, right? <laughs> what would change your mind about him being a good defender or a bad defender? Well, in the mind of Mariner's management, the fact that he hit 20, 30 home runs a year, that, that was a good enough, you know? But if you didn't know that, if you were just trying to evaluate this baseball player, you would say, wow, he's pretty inept. Why does he have a professional contract? And I don't, because that looks easy. I could do that. So what would change your mind about that candidate, right? Um, if, you, if, you, if, you had to, if you absolutely had to hire somebody who knew Rack, for example, um, what would change your mind? Finding out they're on the Rack core team? Maybe that's how much it is. Um, maybe they're just not communicating well with you. So figure that out ahead of time. Then when you get to that, that group feedback position where you discuss the candidate, maybe somebody says something like that. You say, yeah, I really liked her work on Rack. It's, it's been amazing and it's, it's been really uh, stunning. And you're like, wow, like, I guess maybe I was wrong. So sort of questioning your own, your own beliefs and your biases as you come in as an individual and it helps de-bias your team as well. Um, this can sometimes uh, lead to follow-up interviews when you have like, uh, interviewers who are kind of conflicted about whether or not a candidate is good on something. It can be a little problematic because you're asking a person to take another sick day off from work to come in. Um, and uh, So just be careful. Uh, try not to do them if you, if you can avoid it. And really set up the candidate's expectations for what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's so simple to create like, a calendar reminder, right? So tell the candidate, okay, we interviewed on Monday, like, I will, I will let you know by Thursday, 3 p.m. And just go back to your desk and set that, set that as a reminder. You don't have to have a decision by Thursday, 3 p.m., but you for damn sure better tell them, hey, I'm really sorry, we don't have an answer for you yet, but we will have an answer for you on Monday. Because so many candidates and so many interview processes are you go in, you interview, right, and they're like, great, that was awesome, we're really excited, we'll let you know. And then you hear nothing. Forever, and you have to email them or call them a couple times. People have had this experience, a few people. I see some nodding. I see a lot of nodding, actually. Um, that is a really horrible experience, and no one wants to be put there. Be professional about it. Unfortunately, you can't hire everybody. Not every brony is going to get hired. Um, don't make it personal. Uh, you don't need to call anything out in that, in that rejection. Um, but be respectful about it. Um, Try not to say we wish you good luck in your future endeavors. That's like the FU of the interview process, right? 
Um, and if you have a reapplication process, explain it. Um, I know so many people who work for Google now who did not get in on their first try, and some of them didn't even get on their second try. But Google let them know, said, hey, you can reapply in n months. We would really love to see if you could improve your knowledge about data structures or whatever it is, right, that you, you feel like the candidate's lacking. Um, if the candidate asks you for feedback, I think you should give it. I think you should give it. Um, if you have, and if you've gone through this process where you're documenting what your expectations are and how you could change your mind, this is something you can give, them, give to them in a non-actionable way. If you just rejected people and you, couldn't, you can't give them a reason, there's something wrong in your process. Which you should keep improving. And you know, we improve what we measure. So ahead of time, like write down whether or not you think that you will accept this candidate. It should, doesn't have to be uh, any sort of scale. It doesn't have to be, it's not a big thing to take into account. But just un trying to unravel your own personal biases. Somebody worked at Microsoft for 10 years, I don't think I want to hire them. But I get in there and I find out, no, they're really, really good. They're not a Microsoft person, you know? They just worked, maybe they worked at Microsoft because they needed the health insurance for their ailing mother. You don't know. But I, maybe I'm biased against Microsoft and now I can, I can discover that and kind of unpack that a little bit. And you know, we live in this hyper-connected age of LinkedIn and Twitter and everything. It pays to kind of like check in on people that you turn down. How many false negatives are we getting? If we don't hire somebody because we're like, yeah, they're just, they, they just really don't know SQL, that's no good. But then they turn up on like the Postgres project doing like amazing stuff. Like you should find that out. Like where did your process let you down? I'm getting close to the end, but I want to rip through uh, seven interview anti patterns that people still to this day do. Um, anything having to do with your college transcripts, unless the candidate has almost no experience, GPA is useless. Um, it, it's really only indicative for a couple of years out of college about performance. Uh, it's really geared for judging academia. Um, and this is also the conflict between people with programming experience versus CS education. Um, they're not as interchangeable as we think. Um, and if any, you should never ask for high school transcripts. I actually didn't get a job because I didn't graduate from high school. I'm like, 37, I was 37 then. Really, like, I went to college even. Well, I dropped out of college, but you know, like, <laughs> I'm probably gonna leave your company in two or three years anyway. Like, I'm just gonna follow that pattern. What well, does it matter? Uh, negging, do not do this, especially this last one. Um, I read an article in Forbes where the you know, CEO is one cool trick to hiring. He's like, I just look that person in the eye and I say, I don't see the spark. Convince me. What an asshole. <laughs> right? Like, I don't want to work for that guy. He's like, oh, well, you know, 9 out of 10 people don't, don't you know, they kind of walk away with their tail between the legs, but it's that 10th person that I hire and they've got it. I'm like, no, they're a bootlicker. You don't want that person. <laughs> right? Uh, this is also an open invitation to a sexual harassment lawsuit. Right? You are, you're putting in this, per, you're, you have a position of power over this person and you're asking them for a vague, convince me. That's really smarmy and shitty, don't do it. Um, I don't like the submit a pull request to apply, <clears throat> GitHub. Um, there are well-documented barriers to open source software and we're asking people to do free work in exchange for like the opportunity to interview, right? That's, that's just horrible. Um, there's a, a big uh, Rails consulting shop that uh, actually hires you on a, contra on a contractor uh, contract, I guess, for a week. And that's their, that's their interview. They pair with you for a week to do that. But they pay you for it. They fly you out to wherever the office is, and they pay you to work there. I think that's brilliant. I think it's actually absolutely brilliant. No free work. Uh, don't do group and speed interviews. Uh, we did that at the first cohort of ADA. I would never, ever, ever do it again. Um, I, it's hard to wrangle uh, so many candidates and uh, uh, companies. Um, we went with the best that we thought at the time, uh, but I'd love to find a better way to do it. Don't, I, I don't like speed dating things. They're kind of, kind of happy. Uh, puzzle questions, a lot of people still do these. Um, I got asked like, you know, about five trains, all converging in New York, and I'm like, I know nothing about New York. I'm from the West Coast, like what do I know about trains? Um, Google doesn't do puzzle questions anymore. They have enough interviews, and they've done these for a long enough time, that they're able to create a longitudinal uh, analysis of it and say, like, your, your ability to perform on puzzle questions has no bearing on your success at Google. 
Um, Microsoft has stopped doing this. Amazon, all the big companies that are famous for doing these have stopped doing them. You should stop doing them too. All they do is make you feel cool that you know the secret trick. You know, they're like the, the blacksmith puzzles and things like that. Um, I hate whiteboard coding. I refuse to do it. Um, it's super artificial. I can't look anything up. And it's a lean back experience for everybody, right? The person who's doing the interviewing is leaning back and judging instead of collaborating and working with that person. And you want to find those things out, not how well have they memorized standard lib and can they write. Um, also, it is biased against left-handed people. Um, writing at a, a whiteboard when you're left-handed is horrible because you're rubbing your sleeve across the whiteboard. Um, also, most companies don't stock left-handed dry erase markers. So it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> Don't do FizzBuzz. Can we stop FizzBuzz? Uh, I own FizzBuzz.io. Um, plug. Um, yeah, FizzBuzz as a service. Why not? Uh, but, it, but seriously, all you're, all you're uh, really filtering for with this is do they know modulus? Do they know the secret trick? And you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, filtering people for knowing secret tricks. You're building a superhero team. That's what you're doing, right? And we know that we need Superman, and we need Wonder Woman. And sometimes we need Aquaman. Sometimes. <laughs> so do we need a second Aquaman? I mean, we already do a lot with like ponds and inlets and bays. I mean, do we need a second Aquaman? Do we need to be nothing more than a whole bunch of people in red capes that fly around? Do we need a Batman with gadgets to kind of get around the kryptonite? You need to set up your interviewing process so that you find the right fit. And the right fit in terms of skills and personality comes when you actually understand what it is you're looking for. And then you design a process that matches that, that filters for those things. Just like gold panning machines that tumble rocks and then tumble the gravel and then tumble the dirt and tumble the silt to get the gold out, each step of that is a highly tuned piece of machinery and science and physics to extract gold. And your process needs to be just like that, filtering down to catch those little particles of gold, those little tiny individuals who are going to surprise you and just be amazing superstars. I don't know if I want to hire this guy if he showed up at an interview dressed like that. But maybe I do. Maybe he's the best person for the job. And I'm never going to know unless I know what I'm looking for. That's me. That's my talk. Um, I can be found pretty much everywhere. I'm Kerryzor. I have stickers, just like Aaron. Um, I don't have enough ponies, so if you have more ponies, I, I gl gladly accept them. Um, they will not influence my hiring decision, I promise. <laughs> Thank you.